I'm Chef Mitch. Uh, I'm from Cisco, Sacramento. Uh, I have worked with uh, this company almost four years now. Uh, I came to Cisco as a sales rep uh, in 2017, and I uh, did that job for about 18 months. And uh, my ultimate goal coming to Cisco was to get the role that I'm in now, which is a culinary specialist. Um, so I deal with a lot of restaurants, fair concessioners, schools, um, just people that are looking to be more profitable and that are looking to uh, to understand how to better utilize the products that they have or you know, change products eventually as we go through time. But this is kind of the more abstract stuff now. This is kind of in the zone that I live in when it comes to, to the food scene. Um, and uh, uh, it's always tough to, uh, to talk about, you know, personal things and, and your personal processes that you have. Um, I was able to give a presentation uh, like this shortly before uh, coronavirus hit last year. So I just kind of adapted it to today's time. Um, so, so hopefully, hopefully you're able to draw some inspiration from this. And that's really where I like to start off is, is when I'm talking about food trends and I'm talking about my menu offerings, I'd like to start off with what inspires you. Um, for me, uh, I grew up in a very uh, culturally, di culturally diverse part of Sacramento. I lived in the Antelope community. Um, my best friend um, is a first generation immigrant from Laos. Um, uh, I grew up with a lot of different Middle Eastern uh, Eastern European uh, ethnicities and and all, all of these as my neighbors, right? And so, uh, growing up, you know, I was around a lot of different food. I was always interested in my friends' cuisines uh, that they cooked in their homes, um, and so so for me, that's that's part of what inspires me is, is my is my upbringing. Uh, additionally. Uh, my father served for 20 years in the Navy. We were lucky enough to stay in California the entire time. Um, but uh, I have a pursuit for college and, and that, that is also what inspires me. So continuously uh, researching and reading and trying to figure out things that, um, that, are, uh, uh, that are relevant to, to food trends is really important to me. Um, you know, I, I went to culinary school pretty much as a kid. I knew my, my career path was going to take me into this uh, food service industry. Um, in what form, I did not know. Obviously, I would have never imagined that I'd go to work for a distributor rather than being in a restaurant setting. But, um, you know, I, I went through and I decided that I wanted to continue on with my studies because of my uh, because of my dad's service, we were able to have uh, a free tuition through the state. So I went to California State University and I got a bachelor's degree in history. I mean, it's the most out of left field thing that there is, but it, it was all about the research and the knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge that really interested me. And so I, I compiled that, um, that, that uh, research process as a way for me to, to continue in my food studies. So, so think about what inspires you and, and what your process is. And then how do you turn that, men, uh, that inspiration into a menu offering? Uh, really, for me, it's about seasonality. And, and I, I, when I was at the restaurant, the chef's table, like I said, I was there for nine years. We had a hyper, hyper seasonal menu. Um, it was an 18 to 20 menu or item menu. And uh, of that 18 to 20, there was about six items that were always on year round. Other than that, it was rotating three new dishes on and three dishes off every single week. So I was constantly researching the um, uh, season, seasonal availability of various produce items of, of um, you know, a really niche um, uh, center of the plate items. And, and I started to build my dishes based upon the seasonality of the produce that was around us. Cause I mean, we're in Sacramento, right? It, we coin ourselves a farm to fork capital of the world, and and there's a bountiful harvest around us at all times. So why not use the most in-season produce that you can? So that's my process that I use to create my to turn my inspiration into a menu offering. The easiest place for anyone to start with right now is to start with the um, the current trend of of combining a nostalgic food item with a surprise and the surprise tends to be currently an ethnic flavor profile so uh the easiest one for me to always say is grilled cheese sandwiches grilled cheese sandwiches are nostalgic like no other right you always had a grilled cheese sandwich whether you dipped it in ketchup or not um and to putting an ethnic surprise to it you know i think about a kimchi and bacon i'm going to go korean with it i'm going to do a kimchi and bacon grilled cheese sandwich maybe i want to go more uh maybe i want to go more french and i'll do some sort of like braised chicken grilled cheese sandwich and turn it into a coca vin grilled cheese sandwich, something like that. 
you know, it's an easy place to start. There's a lot of really nostalgic items and we saw a lot of no uh, nostalgia in the food that was produced in 2020 because of coronavirus. Everyone wanted comfort food. Everyone wanted to feel comforted. You know, you weren't able to give your grandma that hug, but if you were able to make your grandma's fried chicken, uh, it was a way to still be connected to her, right? So taking those types of memories and then recreating them with that ethnic surprise is, a, is the current trend right now. Um, so a little bit about uh, food trends and how uh, they get adapted into menus. I just call this slide the food trends life cycle. So uh, food trends start off in the authentic inception stage. And so these are the really uh, uh, ethnic independent restaurants. These are the really chef forward fine dining places that use like really fine tweezers to put little things on men, uh, onto their dishes. Um, these are the guys that are the cutting edge people, right? And so they, they come up with the trend and, and it starts to gain traction. Then it moves into this adoption phase where people are creatively adapting it for a for a microcosm of, of their communities, right? So you're thinking you're looking at gastro pubs, you're looking at chef casual restaurants, food trucks. I would say fair concessioners also stand in here. Um, uh, you know, this could be maybe we're dumbing it down a little bit to make it more presentable. Then we start to get into the proliferation stage where really we're, we're starting to mass produce this. This is going to be in the local chains, you know, here in Sacramento, you start to see it on menus at Jack's Urban Eats or something like that. Um, you start to see it on, on college campus menus like at UC Davis where they have a really nice food program. And then we get to the ubiquity stage where everyone's doing it. There's a healthy version that's available for kids now. You know, there's a senior care version. And, and at that point, it's kind of when we need to go back to this adoption phase. So, so for you guys as concessionaires, you really live in this adoption proliferation stage. So, so keeping your nose to the ground and, and understanding what the upcoming trends are is really important that, so that it's not just the next, fried, uh, the next deep fried thing, right? We want to go past the next deep fried thing. And while that's great, and if that's your shtick, then that's awesome. But, but moving past that and staying up with the trends, or how do we deep fry something that's not meant to be deep fried? I mean, those deep fried crickets at the state fair a couple of years ago were pretty good. Um, uh, uh, biggest example that I, I use here is Nashville Hot Chicken. Nashville Hot Chicken started at a restaurant in, in uh, Nashville because a woman was mad at her husband and she wanted to make the hottest fried chicken she could make for him. Well, the dude ended up liking it. Then it started to spread a little bit over the country. That's in the adoption phase. It's moving into the proliferation phase right now where we're starting to see Nashville Hot Chicken on fast food restaurant or menus like uh, I think Popeye's has a version. I'm pretty sure Wendy's is introducing one pretty soon. So when we start to see it move towards that proliferation and the proliferation into ubiquity, that's kind of when we need to move away from it and go figure out what the next thing is that we can start to introduce. So some of the resources that I use, um, I, I, I'm old school. I have uh, paid subscriptions to Bon Appetit and Food and Wine. I get the physical copies every month. I go through with, uh, with some sticky notes and highlight the pages that I like, you know, things I want to try to recreate in a way that makes sense for me to present to customers. Um, there's also freed versions, you know, if you just go on to Bon Appetit or foodandwine.com, you can, you can sign up to get their weekly emails. Uh, one thing I really like to look at is, is the, they always send out like a 30 or 31 best recipes to make in the month. Um, so the one most recently was obviously January. They usually come out like two days into the month. Uh, a website that I like to use is eater.com, and there's regional variations of this. Um, so for um, so for, for me in Sacramento, I look at sf.eater.com, which is San Francisco, uh, because uh, working for Cisco Sacramento, we cover the Oregon border down to Martinez and all of northern Nevada out to Fallon, uh, which is pretty east in Nevada. Um, so uh, my food trends, I kind of grab from San Francisco. They come to me in Sacramento. I'm able to pass them off to Reno. And then I also look, uh, I also look at Portland, which is pdx.eater.com. I look at Portland and see how things funnel into Eureka. So that way I'm up on that because the Eureka and Portland markets tend to be very similar in the, in the, um, you know, the health conscious type items, all naturals, organic type stuff. Books that I have, The Food Lover's Companion is a great book. Think about it as like a thesaurus. Say you're researching food trends and you don't quite understand what something is. You look it up in The Food Lover's Companion, page 275, there it is. I was looking for it. I get a little description of it. And then from there, I have some more knowledge going forward. I uh, talk to you a little bit about my process of seasonality. So The Flavor Bible is a book that was always in my bag when I was in the restaurant. Um, 
Uh, it, literally, you look up an item and it'll tell you the seasonal, the, the seasonality of it, and it'll tell you flavor profiles that go along with it as well. Uh, I always use fennel as an example because for some reason I order fennel and I always have four bulbs left over. So what do I do with it now? So maybe as I look up fennel and I see that you know it's really popular in the winter time, and I see that it goes great with citrus. So maybe I'm going to do some sort of fennel and citrus salad. And then I think, okay, well, another form of citrus is blood orange. I can make a blood orange dressing for that. And then I need to add this to make it a small plate. You know, maybe I'm going to do like two pan seared uh, scallops with that. And all of a sudden there's a small plate. We figure out the garnishments and we're ready to go and stuff all day. The NAMP Meat Buyer's Guide is for more chef forward restaurants. However, I think it is applicable, especially for uh, Hispanic restaurant or Hispanic food trucks and concessionaires. Um, the reason why this is so good is because it, it, it tells you the actual codes that you're looking for for products. So say, say you've always used um, chuck roll for your carne asada. Now you want to move into, uh, now you want to move into a shoulder pod. So if you're looking, you can go and look at shoulder clot in there and it'll tell you whatever the code is for it. And then you can communicate that to your sales reps in order to find that exact type of, of meat that you're looking for. It also has a chicken and lamb and pork in there as well. Uh, and then generally, I just like to look at new cookbooks, right? I'm always looking just to see what the new cookbooks are for the season, the most popular ones that are coming out, um, you know, whether it's on Barnes and Nobles, on Amazon, whatever. You don't necessarily need to go out and purchase them, but at least you can kind of know what's trending uh, as far as the, the theme is. Uh, some TV shows and documentaries I like. I love Mind of a Chef. Uh, it, 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 is, it was on Netflix. I'm not sure if it still is, but it's a PBS publication. And it kind of goes through what I'm doing right now. It's literally getting into the mind of the chef to understand their process, right? So my favorite season is Sean Brock. He's kind of my chef. I, don't, I'm, I model a lot of what I do after what Sean Brock does. Um, uh, chef's Table on Netflix, again, this is for more like fine dining type restaurants, but at least you're able to get on. And at, at the very least, it's got great cinematography to it. So it's a beautiful watch. Um, but, you know, you can kind of see what's trending and pick up a couple tips and tricks that can make you more efficient. And then the last thing is Parts Unknown. Uh, Anthony Bourdain, rest in peace, uh, show that he produced while he was uh, uh, right before he was passing or right before he passed away. Um, this is a CNN show, but he did so much traveling through Southeast Asia during his last couple of seasons on here. That, um, and that's where we're seeing a lot of trends come from right now in Southeast Asia. So uh, it's definitely a great watch for you. And I told you a little Cisco commercial, shameless plug. Our Cisco Foodie Magazine is a great resource to have. Um, it's free available to you at any time, foodie.cisco.com. We come out with them uh, quarterly. Uh, and in there, you get a lot of tips about how to be more profitable, generally speaking. Um, uh, whatever current trends are and recipes for you to go ahead and make these dishes. Again, it's free to you. And if you need someone to help you find it, uh, you can reach out to any of the sales reps that are on right now. Um, one thing that I think is important to talk about when we talk about uh, some trends is social media. And so uh, just some social media best practices for you here. Uh, you need to be active on social media platforms. And then depending on the age group that you're trying to reach, uh, depends on the platform that you're using. If you want to hit the Gen Zers, you know, you're probably using Snapchat or TikTok. If you want to hit my generation, the millennials, you're probably on Snapchat or Instagram. And if you want to be into the, to the 45 plus, you're probably starting to look at Facebook. Um, but for the most part, Instagram and, and Snapchat are great ones to use. Obviously, Facebook is also really good to use because you can just do one post and it goes to both together. Um, so while still photos are really good, people really like to see videos and snapshots and stories. So, you know, maybe you have an idea of it's your signature dish and you're, and your guys cooking it up and you take a little, you know, you start off a little story. Hey, what's up guys. It's chef Mitch here. I'm out at the California state fair this year and I'm with blah, blah, blah. And they're making this thing. And you kind of just go through the guy's process of making whatever the dish is. Um, that's the type of stuff that people are really interested in. They'll tune in and continue to watch that. Uh, you need to have someone that manages your social media that has a consistent voice. Um, and by voice, I don't mean actual voice. I mean, you know, the, the, the theme of what you're talking about. It really helps you to develop your brand and it really helps you to develop your brand images in your, in your customer's perspective. And the last thing is to use hashtags and geotags. So, uh, you know, come up with your set of hashtags that you want to reach because uh, I don't know if not a lot of people know, but you can just 
follow a hashtag and anytime a picture pops up underneath that that's been hashtag with a photo it'll pop up in your feed so maybe it's hashtag nashville hot chicken maybe it's hashtag state fair maybe it's hashtag fair concessions whatever it may be come up with your unique set of tags that you put on every post and then the people following that will be able to follow those will be able to find those photos or videos and and as far as geotags go you know i know a lot of you guys travel up and down the west coast uh, you know, so geotag where you're at. Maybe you're in San Diego this week, and maybe in two weeks you're in Portland, and maybe two weeks after that you're in Seattle. Whatever it may be, uh, ch tag where you're at in every photo, so that, that way the local people around there, you can also search for places around you. They can find you and where you're at. And above all, it's free, and who doesn't like free, right? Uh, so moving into a little bit of food trends, like I said, I did this presentation at the beginning of uh, in January of last year. Uh, so I wanted to kind of touch on a couple of food trends that we predicted for 2020. Uh, one was the digital invasion. Obviously, uh, we're living in a very digital world right now with uh, the rise of third party delivery. Um, for you guys, it might not make a whole lot of sense to be aligned, but it's just one of the things that we started talking about. QR code menus are huge right now, right? Everything trying to go touchless. Um, so, you know, we talked a lot about digital invasion. We talked about the rise of ghost kitchens and virtual kitchens. And uh, for some of you, you know, uh, if you do have a brick and mortar spot that you that you operate out of, virtual kitchens are a great way to go about um, to go about getting uh, an, an additional revenue stream in your in your facility. Um, you know, this is only online. There is no pickup. It is just delivered through a third party company, whether it's DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, Cisco's aligned with Uber Eats. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 a very easy way to to expand your offerings and maybe do something a little bit different. And then the last thing was regional cuisine. So you know, instead of just focusing on Korean or or say say um, Mexican food, we started to focus more on Oaxacan food or food from the Yucatan. We started to focus on uh, you know uh, the different uh, flavors of ramen uh, throughout ja uh, throughout Japan. And then lastly, we started to talk a little bit more about North African food, um, but really uh, that gets me going into 2021 is some of the trends that we're forecasting is, uh, you know, obviously with the social unrest that happened this summertime, um, there have been some, some, some uh, grants and monies out there for black owned businesses. So we are going to see a rise in West African cuisine, which is going to be amazing. Um, we're going to see, uh, Really, you know, Ma uh, Marcus Samuelson is a really popular guy. Uh, Kwame, I can't even try to pronounce his last name. Um, he's from the he's from the East Coast in DC area. Um, he's opening up his first couple restaurants. We're gonna see uh, American takes on a lot of these traditional West African foods, and so expect those to start to become more trendy in the next year or two as they make their way westward um, to us. Also, we're gonna see. Uh, uh, you know, we talked about comfort food and how popular that was in 2020. Well, one of the predicted trends is that it's it's obviously we're still in the middle of coronavirus. Uh, uh, people are still searching for comfort through food. So comfort food is obviously going to be really big, but maybe it's comfort food in a healthier way. Um, you know, a lot of people joke around that they, you know, you go to college and you gain your freshman 15, or you had your year at home and you gained your COVID-19. Well, a lot of people are gonna try to work that off this year. So we're gonna see a lot of health uh, health conscious moves um, a continuing of the flexitarian diet and of mainstream veganism. Um, and then the last thing is uh, really for uh, millennials and Gen Zers, we love spicy food. We absolutely love spicy food. So continue to see a rise in spicier foods. Some senses, the spicier, the better. I think that really plays well with your guys' arena. Um, and just the use of, of uh, ethnic spices in more, um, in more uh, wide, widely known cuisine.